Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I did start the EEG last time, and I came to the EEG lead systems. And I just briefly mentioned that the 1020 system, the Jasper system, is the dominating clinical EEG recording system. And it is, uh, it is good, it is very easy to locate the electrodes accurately to the scalp, to the correct positions, so it is a rep reproducible system. I don't go to the details anymore, I told that last time. And I did mention that uh, this is Mr. Jasper, who headed or uh, directed the committee, which make this recommendation. And I did mention that there is an interesting fundamental mistake in the uh, illustration of the uh, electrode positions. It is uh, in the illustration they are shown on the cortex, not on the scalp. So I come to the new material and after the Jasper system, the next more accurate system, lead system, is this one, intermediate electrode system having 75 electrodes, where it is added an electrode just in between each pair of those uh, Jasper electrode system. 75 electrodes, it is quite a large number, but that is not so much used anymore. It is either the clinical Jasper system or then the high resolution systems which have still more electrodes. But this is a good system anyhow. What does the EEG record? There are many different methods to uh, combine the electrodes for getting the signal. Uh, typical basic uh, systems are bipolar and unipolar measurements. Just very simple example here to show that if it is taken a bipolar measurement, here is an uh, epileptic focus uh, which has strong uh, uh, neuronal activity which proceeds like waves uh, along the cortex. And if it is here in the middle of this pair of electrodes symmetrically, then both electrodes get quite similar uh, signal at the same time. So the bipolar measurement is very close to zero with these two electrodes. Unlike with that pair and that pair, we get a larger signal. In unipolar measurement, if the electrode is close to the epileptic seizure, we get large signal further away, the signal is smaller. Very simple, but just indicating how many different ways there do exist for getting the uh, signal. Laplacian method is the one typical method to get signals. I don't have a picture of here. I speak now about the sensitivity distribution of EEG electrodes. There is a fundamental seminal article on this problem written by Rush and Riscoll, published in 1969. EEG electrode sensitivity, an application of reciprocity. Uh, the fundamental idea in this paper is, was or is that they used a concentric spherical model. And as I told you earlier, it has so much symmetry that it is possible to calculate the lead fields with closed form equations. There is no iteration needed. That is the fundamental uh, message or fundamental property of that paper. We recalculated the results with just the same equations what Rush and Riscoll used. Uh, it is published in 97. And we made something more. We added the isosensitivity surfaces and half sensitivity volumes to these results. I show you. Here is the concentric three concentric spheres model of Russian Riscoll. I did show you before already, but I repeat. The radii of the outer surface of the brain 
is 80 millimeters, outer surface of the skull 85 and outer surface of the scalp 92 millimeters. And the resistivity of the brain material and the scalp material is the same and the resistivity of the scalp, uh, sc skull region is 80 times higher. This is an interesting fundamental error in this work. I do not blame Russian Riskol. It was not the purpose of the paper to find out what, uh, what are the resistivity ratios. No, it was the fundamental main purpose of the paper to derive the equations to solve this problem. And uh, with those equations you may calculate using whichever resistivity ratios you want. So it was fundamental paper in that sense. They got the number 80 from some experiment which they had uh, earlier and they did not pay too much attention to the resistivity values. And what is surprising is that this paper was published in 69 and this resistivity ratio existed in the literature and in the, in the, in the works what the uh, scientists in this field made without doubt over 30 years. That is surprising. There's, there was not too much discussion about whether the, those values are correct or not. This value was used for over 30 years. What is good in this uh, misunderstanding or mis wrong uh, values is that when all scientists were using the same values, then the results were comparable. But unfortunately, it, it caused quite much uh, misunderstanding in, in the nature of EEG recording using this uh, value of 80. What is correct value, as I have told you before, in uh, bio, bio, bio uh, word, there is no correct, single correct value. But the value which is used nowadays uh, more often is something between 5 and 15. <coughs> Let's observe this figure in more detail. They did not use a slab model, a thin pizza model or disk model. They used really a spherical model, but it is illustrated here the one on one plane. They did feed one unit current, let's say one ampere current in the calculation to this electrode and taking it out from the model from this electrode. So this is a reciprocal current. Uh, and I have told you several times that please do not feed one ampere current to your patient. He will die immediately. So this is theoretical, theoretical issue. One microampere, one picoampere is just the same. You find how the current is distributing here. Most of the current is flowing in the scalp region and small fraction of the current is flowing through the high resistivity skull. What are these blue lines? They are current flow lines indicating that between two consecutive lines there exists equal amount of current. So the density of these lines indicates the current density. You find here a certain detail. You find that these current flow lines, they break here and again here. I remember that the reviewer of this paper when we submitted it said that there's some mistake because the current cannot stop here. Why, why does, do these current flow lines just break? Uh, he didn't understand it fully. If this were a slab, a disk, then the current flow lines would not break because current flow would flow throughout the, through the, the disk. But because this is a spherical model, part of the current of course is flowing in this plane, but most of the current is flowing in that region which you don't see in this uh, flat uh, uh, presentation. And to indicate the current is density is uh, uh, decreasing faster in the full three-dimensional model. And to 
give the correct impression about the current density, we must break the current flow lines so that it is the, the, the current density is true, truly proportional to the density of the flow lines. That is the story. These flow lines, Russian Riskol did calculate. In addition, we calculated surfaces which indicate either current density. The current density is constant on these surfaces. Here it is 40 uh, amperes per square meter, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and 100. So, what is this current density, current flowing here? This is the reciprocal current and it is exactly the same as the measurement sensitivity of this lead in this volume conductor. That comes from the principle of reciprocity. We feed a unit current and find out what is the current density throughout the model and the measurement sensitivity is exactly described with the current density. So what you learn here, you learn that there is a very high current density in the scalp region indicating that the EEG measurement sensitivity is very high on the scalp and it is much much lower in the brain region and you find that it is uh, more or less linearly proceeding in the brain region and the measurement sensitivity is something uh, 35 here in the center of the sphere increasing when coming closer and closer to the electrode being 147 the maximum measurement sensitivity unit or current density just under the electrode. Isosensitivity surfaces which are these isocurrent density surfaces are shown here. This indicates what is the direction of the measurement sensitivity and what is the value, absolute value of the measurement sensitivity. In addition to these isosensitivity surfaces, we calculated a concept, half sensitivity volume. Perhaps I should, because this is the first time it exists, I should write it down. Half sensitivity volume, HSV. What does it mean? It means that we find out, we calculate where is the surface, where the measurement sensitivity, magnitude of the measurement sensitivity is one half of the maximum. And we uh, shade with a green color this region which is bounded with this half sensitivity uh, surface. What is the idea here? The idea is that uh, if we assume, which is uh, the, the most uh, simple assumption, that the activity of the brain is uh, homogeneously distributed uh, firing of, of, the, uh, of the, uh, the brain cells, then of course to this lead, if we have electrodes here, uh, placed, most of the signal comes from there where the measurement sensitivity is highest. Of course most of the signal is coming from here close to the electrodes and from this region here where the measurement sensitivity is low, not too much signal is coming from here. So the concept of half sensitivity volume indicates how well the lead system is able to focus its measurement sensitivity. The smaller the half sensitivity volume, the smaller is the region in the brain from where the signal comes. So this is a, an indication for the, for the uh, uh, spatial resolution. Why half sensitivity volume? Well, that's one selection. We could use one third sensitivity or whichever. We selected half sensitivity. Is that the best one? I don't want to discuss that. Maybe someone may show that that is not the best, the best value, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't change the, the, the principle at all. 
So, you have learned from this first picture that what the EEG measures primarily is the electric activity on your scallop. That is important, therefore, that it is a source of, uh, of noise. There are, uh, on the side of the head, there are muscles on the scallop. Not on, on the top of the head, there, is, there are no muscles, but on the sides there are muscles. So if the muscles are activated uh, on eyebrows uh, or, or, or jaw muscles, they generate uh, electric activity and they generate strong noise because the measurement sensitivity is here strong, the high. That is the story. Secondly, you see that the measurement sensitivity is oriented horizontally. In this case, I mean that in the direction uh, where the, the axis between the electrodes are. And you also learn that in the center of the brain, where the measurement sensitivity is about, uh, or actually here it is, minimum is 28, but in the center of the brain about 30 plus minus something. It is uh, low measurement sensitivity, but just under the electrodes, it is uh, five times uh, stronger. As Russian uh, recall, we made similarly that we changed the location of the electrodes so that they are 120 degrees distance, uh, 60 degrees distance, 40 degrees distance, and finally 20 degrees distance. Uh, you don't quite see in this illustration what, what I mean, uh, so let's go back. You see that uh, the current, lead field current is flowing here tangentially, tangentially to the head. And the measurement sensitivity is concentrated, of course, under the electrodes. Unlike here, the measurement sensitivity is mostly radial to the sphere. If the electrodes are close to each other, then the measurement sensitivity is tangential. In this case, you see clearly how the measurement sensitivity is very low on the opposite side, 2.5, and the maximum is 108. So it is uh, 40 times uh, higher the measurement sensitivity under the electrodes, which means that with this kind of bipolar measurement, you don't get any signal, practically any signal, anywhere else than just from under the electrodes. So this is, I repeat, the calculation, the derivation of the equations and the calculation, basic calculation was made by Russian Riskol, and we recalculated the results and uh, we uh, in addition, we calculated the isosensitivity surfaces and we generated or uh, uh, created the concept of half sensitivity volume. Here is uh, shown the illustrations from the Russian Riskol original article. I told you sometimes when I was uh, speaking about the, the, the re principle of reciprocity that I use the reciprocal current to indicate the lead field, to indicate the measurement sensitivity direction. Rush and Riskol used the isopotential surfaces. Of course, they are the same thing because they are just connected with, with, with simple equation. Here it is shown with the isopotential surfaces, electrodes are here on the opposite side, sides, and these are the isopotential uh, surfaces. But the problem with this presentation is that it is not easy to see what is the direction of the measurement sensitivity and how to find the magnitude of the measurement sensitivity. The magnitude is found as a negative gradient of these isopotential surfaces and similarly the, the direction. So these are not, in my mind, these are not at all equally illustrative as the current flow illustration. Anyhow, the result is here with these uh, uh, electrodes coming closer. And then they finally, uh, they 
evaluated the uh, uh, result which they obtained by taking a skull of a monkey. They did split it to half and they did fill this brain region with saline which had the same resistivity as the, as the brain tissue and fed electric current here to the head and measured the isopotential surfaces in the real skull and recognized that yes they have quite similar results as what are the measurements. Then I speak something more about the EEG signal. Uh, how does it look like? Here are some examples of the EEG signals. Uh, it is uh, typical that uh, they are named by alphabetical uh, uh, symbols, alpha, beta, delta, theta, but this alphabetical order is not the same as the order of the frequency bands. It is a historical order. That's very often happens in, in, in experimental uh, sciences. It was the alpha wave which was first found and named alpha. And then it was found the beta waves and so on. They are not in beautiful frequency brain, uh, range uh, frequency order which we engineers would like to see. But that is historical. Uh, alpha waves. Uh, alpha, alpha wave is the basic uh, frequency of the brain. How could I say it? It is a basic frequency of what, what's going on in the brain. Uh, if eyes are closed, it is dominating. If eyes are opened, there is coming so much information, huge amount of information to the brain, so that the alpha wave will uh, be suppressed and the activity, what is consequence of the, of the visual signal, is, uh, is dominating in the brain. Theta waves uh, are slower waves showing that the activity what's going on there is, uh, is, is slower. It is sh seen either in children which do not yet have developed brain or in adults when adults are sleeping. Delta waves are still slower activity. You understand that if there is slow activity with slow frequency, low frequency, then also the amplitude is growing. Uh, this is found in uh, infants, very newborn babies, which have not uh, developed brain activity, and in sleeping adults, where the, in sleeping stage the, the, the brain activity is, is low. Here is an example of epileptic spikes, that is uh, one uh, uh, brain disease for some reason. Well, I would need a neurolo neurologist to, to tell all the reasons, but one reason is just that in some spot, in some focus of the brain, there is some strong activity which is spreading throughout the brain. This is epilepsy, epileptic activity and uh, and as you know, due to the epileptic activity, the, the person loses the consciousness and has some, some uh, muscular activities, involuntary and so on. Uh, EEG activity is dependent on the level of consciousness. Awake person has the alpha wave. In light sleep, it looks something like this. In REM sleep, the activity is quite high. What is REM sleep? It is rapid eye movement sleep. Rapid eye movement means that the person is, uh, is, uh, uh, has very uh, real uh, dreams and perhaps moving his uh, hands and, and legs. So it is almost like being awake. When being in the deep sleep, I did show the activity is very slow, low frequency, but high amplitude. And here is several cerebral death person who's die, uh, who has, whose brain have been for a long time without blood support, oxygen support, and the brain is uh, dead. Then there is, of course, just straight line. Here is some example of, of uh, EEG activity during sleep. 
Uh, sleep is an important process. Uh, we sleep about one third of our life. So uh, I have been sleeping over 20 years. Uh, so that's, uh, that's quite a long time. We should not forget how important part of my life that is. Uh, sleeping is not a simple process. We do just don't fall asleep and wake up. No, it is a complicated process. Complicated process. There are some very interesting results in the EEG activity during sleep. Here is a typical, typical uh, recording of a one night's session of a person who is sleeping. And here are different stages uh, of, of brain activity. Uh, the usually it goes from awake to the REM stage and deeper and deeper and then coming uh, higher back. You see that just before falling asleep, person is awake and then there is uh, stage one, stage two, three and stage four, which is a very deep sleep. And then the person is a little bit waking, uh, not uh, fully waking up, but uh, raising a few st uh, levels up, then falling to uh, deep sleep again, and so on, perhaps waking up for a short period of time, going back to sleep, and so on. So this is very typical. So there's no single deep sleep, as you may think, you fall asleep, and then you wake up to the alarm clock, and you think that that's it. No, it's much more complicated, interesting process. The larger number of electrodes there are in the EEG system, of course, the more accurate image of the electric activity of the brain is obtained. Here is uh, just uh, recorded 64 electrodes and calculated the distribution of, of uh, electric field on the scalp. And from those electrodes, it is just extracted 21 electrodes. And from those signals, it is possible to uh, uh, calculate this kind of distribution of electric activity on the scalp. You find, of course, this is self-evident. The more electrodes, the more accurate uh, image of the electric field on the scalp is possible to obtain. N nothing nothing uh, too uh, dif difficult. This is a typical high-resolution EEG recording device that we we have in Tampere, it is a Neuroscan device having 256 channels. Typical in these high resolution EEG devices is that unlike in, in the clinical Jasper system, where the electrode locations are accurately defined and electrodes placed always to the same locations, unlike in high resolution EEG, it is used a cap where the electrodes are. The cap is placed to the head of the subject to the patient. It goes where it goes. We don't know first where it goes. And after that process, it, it starts a special location of the uh, electrodes with different methods. A classical method to, uh, to uh, locate the electrodes is so-called Polhemus system. There is a kind of pen which, uh, which uh, reacts or, or detects a magnetic field which is generated with certain transmitters around and the pen is placed to the electrode and press the button and then it is recorded that aha uh -huh, the pen is at that location. So it is electrode by electrode it is found the location of each electrode and stored to the computer. So first it is placed the cap to the head and then it is found that where the electrodes really are. Uh, there is one, well, this kind of electrode systems are produced by several, several uh, manufacturers. There is one company which is a very different solution. Is it good or bad? That's another issue. It has uh, certain interesting properties, but, uh, but uh, uh, some of those properties are good and some are bad, just like usually. In this kind of electrode systems, you see that there is a hole in the center of the electrode and it is placed uh, 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 electric uh, 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 jelly with a syringe to each of these electrodes to find, uh, uh, to reach a good uh, electrode skin contact, which is low enough. In this electrical geodesis company system, uh, the, you find that the electrodes, uh, can you see it's quite 
light here, but anyhow, the, in the tip of the electrodes, there is a piece of sponge. How this electrode system is first in, in, in a vessel which has saline, so that they come wet these sponges. And then it is placed over the patient's head, and this sponge is wet, and it makes the con contact from the uh, silver electrode which is inside the uh, sponge to the scalp. So it is very quick to place when this uh, system needs uh, maybe one or even two hours time to get all the electrodes well working with the, with the electrolyte, uh, electrolytic jam and so on. This is fast, it takes maybe 10, at most 15 minutes to put it on the head of the, uh, of the patient and get good recording. What is also good is that, uh, that the electrode jelly is unpleasant. Uh, after the recording session made with this electrode system, the, uh, the head of the patient is full of that, uh, that jelly and, and needs to, hair needs to be uh, uh, washed and that is not so too pleasant. But in this case, uh, it is only saline. So after the session, the electrode uh, system may be taken away and the gentleman was combing his hair and he was just ready to go to the afternoon dancing. There is no, uh, no inconvenience. One problem here with this system is, which I'm a bit afraid, is that when there's coming the uh, uh, saline from these, all these sponges, it makes actually it makes the whole scalp wet and saline is quite good, uh, uh, quite well conducting electricity which means that uh, there are short circuits between the electrodes due to the uh, saline which has made all the scalp wet. So these are issues which are discussed, uh, discussed uh, always with, with scientists who are making experiments with this high resolution systems. But just to characterize, what means the geodesis? Uh, this is uh, the, the companies in, 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 in Oregon, in the United States. The geodesis means that uh, the, the geodes the, that is the shortest distance between uh, points on the spherical surface. And the, the, you see that the, these, these uh, stripes which are connecting the electrodes, they, they just obey that geodesis uh, uh, ge ge geometrical uh, uh, principle. When the, the traditional way to, to locate the electrodes is uh, use the Polhemus system, the pointing pen, electrical geodesis has this kind of photogrammetric localization system, which means that uh, they have small cameras here and uh, these uh, joints of these bars and they take photographs from the, from the subject, but they do not have automatic system. They, they have, this is an old system, but even today, in my understanding, they do not have any automatic system to locate the electrodes. The, the figures, pictures are taken to the computer screen, and the operator has to manually point with the mouse from each of these uh, three pictures the same electrode where it is in these projections and then the system calculates where it is in space. So it is time consuming but it can be made after the whole recording session. Here are some nice pictures of a very very small infant having the electrical geodesis system in the head. I think this system is the only one which can be used in so small babies. Charming, charming, small, small baby. This is a completely different system uh, actually, I was thinking for a while about uh, making experiments on this kind of systems, but, uh, but we, we uh, didn't spend too much time. Here is some idea. The idea is that there is a rigid helmet, and here are these kind of, of, of bars going through the el helmet, and in the tip of the bar there is an electrode, and it is known accurately where these, uh, these bars are, and it is sensed how deep they go. So ac actually it is obtained the full uh, uh, information of the surface of the, 
or the form of the head and where the electrodes are. But this is this seems to be very very heavy. I don't. It seems to be well constructed. It is apparently a Japanese fellow is is uh, as a patient in a Japanese system. But I have not seen any other. Uh, uh, application of this than only this one publication. Interesting, anyhow. Uh, in EEG technology, as I said in the beginning, I don't speak too much about the technology, but I just mentioned that uh, in our uh, understanding, it is the, the active electrode which is the way to make good EEG recordings and actually any other bioelectric signal recordings. I made very long time ago a few applications to the Academy of Finland for starting project of that. Uh, maybe they thought that it is uh, too revolutionary and they didn't believe that. I, I got some money, but quite late. And we designed a, an active electrode. So it has a very small amplifier in the electrode, which amplifier actually is only an impedance transformer. It has a very high input impedance, uh, uh, some, some uh, mega or giga ohms input impedance and output impedance less than one ohm. So that is a way to do the system so that when it has high input impedance, the electrode skin contact impedance is uh, not uh, uh, dominating, it is not so critical. And when it has low output impedance, then the noise which is coming from the environment to the uh, to the leads don't make any problem. So just impedance transformer. Here's an example of the signal recorded uh, just with a classical electrode and with a, a smart electrode or active, uh, active electrode. So you see that the noise level is much, much lower. That's a good point. We also added a system which uh, it detects what is the skin electrode impedance. In the electrode there is a LED light and it indicates with its color. It is programmed so that the, if the impedance is good enough, low value, it shows green. If it is too high, it shows red. So it is smart electrode. It is possible with the electrode itself find what is the, the, the uh, input impedance. Here is some uh, two ladies from my group. Uh, these electrodes look similar. They are actually not made by us. They are commercial, but uh, anyhow, they are active electrodes. This is the photogrammic localization which we made. Unfortunately, we didn't get the pro project uh, to, to, to couldn't finalize the project. And the reason was that I, I uh, uh, did uh, retire and I, uh, our money did not continue further. So we had to uh, discontinue the project. But the idea is that we have three cameras, cameras like EGI, uh, electrical geodesis also has cameras. But the point is that uh, these electrodes, each electrode has a LED light, firstly to, to, to indicate the, the electrode impedance, but secondly, for this electrode localization, one of these lights is activated at a time. So these cameras, when they find one light, it is the same light, the same electrode always. There's no problem in, in finding what of the electrodes is in question. It is the electrode which has the light. And uh, we just tested it. We, we took uh, this uh, geographical map sphere. You know this, of course, because there we have the coordinates printed on the uh, sphere. We placed these LED lights on the uh, certain uh, places on the coordinates here. We did activate one light at a time and with the cameras we did find its location and it is shown on computer screen in this way. So we got it working uh, but um, we didn't finalize the project, unfortunately. Well that's how it usually is. It's typical that when one, someone is retiring many projects are just uh, uh, breaking and discontinued, uh, my colleague Oli Lonesman from the Low Temperature Physics Laboratory was very bitter because so many projects were just cut down when he got retired. I think we should be very happy that we had so many projects which, which did discontinue. How bad professors we had been if we had had no project 
which had dis discontinued after retirement. That's how the life goes. Here is one example. It is possible to find the location of the electrode or the LED light even more accurately than what is the pixel accuracy of the camera. There's some process just to, to process the image and find sub-pixel localization accuracy. That's what we made also. Anyhow, finding the distribution of uh, electric activity or the electric field on the scalp, recording it accurately, gives us a possibility to calculate what is the distribution of the electric field on the cortex. That's what we are primarily interested in. And as I told you before, this inverse solution, where the inverse solution is calculated to a surface, certain surface, it is possible to solve. It is uh, uh, solved this uh, problem by Yamashita and, and Takahashi. Those are the seminal papers which, which uh, uh, were first written on this. I repeat that as I told that the inverse problem in general is not solvable because there are infinite number of solutions which uh, fit to the, to the or, or uh, may produce the distribution of electric field on the scalp what you record. But if you limit the solution to some surface, whichever, it is natural to select for the surface, the surface of the cortex, then the inverse problem is so much limited, so not so uh, ungeneralized, generalized problem that it is possible to solve accurately. This is a very important issue. There are some uh, beautiful pictures you can find from the literature about the location of the sources and so on. Uh, here is one work which we, we made, uh, which uh, also is, is relevant, which is uh, detection of deep sources. Just as I told you a few minutes ago, the measurement sensitivity under the electrode is very high and in the center of the sphere it is very low. How to find out, detect the activities in the center of the brain? Uh, one way is to use stimulation, large number of stimulations and record the response and then make an averaging. And then you find out finally synchronized with, with the stimulation and you find out what is the, the response just here in the certain region of the brain. It's a time consuming process anyhow. How to improve this uh, measurement sensitivity in the center of the brain? The best obtainable sensitivity ratio is equal or homogeneous sensitivity. Unfortunately, it is not possible to design a lead system which has a low sensitivity on the cortex and high sensitivity in the center when using only electrodes on the scalp. Unfortunately, it is not possible. If you find a solution for that, then you may just start waiting for a Nobel Prize. So that's, that's the case. The best possibility, the best obtainable sensitivity ratio, in my understanding, is an e equal or homogeneous sensitivity. How can we generate an homogeneous sensitivity here? That's an old story. I told you already before that let's con extend the volume conductor with a material which has the same resistivity as the volume conductor, plate it here with the higher conductivity plates. Then we may cut this extension to bars, still it is homogeneous measurement sensitivity in the homogeneous volume conductor, and we may replace these, uh, these extensions with real resistors. That is the method. So, similarly, we can proceed even with this uh, inhomogeneous model. The measurement sensitivity, the, the magnitude is shown with a color bar. If we have two electrodes, you see that the measurement sensitivity under the electrode is very high red and low blue everywhere else. Having 58 electrodes, we get a little bit better situation. 102 electrodes, 
and finally 202 electrodes, it is almost homogeneous, practically homogeneous throughout the volume conductor. That's the way to improve relatively the measurement sensitivity in the center. And we calculated the results in average 114 electrodes used, signal to noise ratio improved with a factor of 1.7. That is not very much, but instead of 2000 stimulation epochs, only 690 epochs are needed for the same signal to noise ratio. This is a remarkable, important improvement when thinking how, how unpleasant it is for the patient to stay long, long time to get all the 2000 epochs where what is the stimulation itself is not painful, but it is long lasting process that can be reduced to 690 epochs to get the same signal quality. That's important. Um, there's also another method which is called beamformer method, which is mathematically uh, a bit different, but it comes to the same, same result. I'm a lead field man, we use lead fields. Other groups use beam formers, but we come to the same conclusion. I may skip this one, yeah. That's about EEG, and now I go to the magnetoencephalography. And in this session, I again start with Hans Berger and mention well, Hans Berger measured in 1924, the first recording of EEG, the first recording of MEG, the magnetic signal from the electric activity of the brain, was made in 1968 uh, by David Cohan from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He used first room temperature coils, which I hardly believe but I, I'm sure he has done it. Measurements are, of course, much better to do with squids, superconducting quantum interference device. And here is a very good signal quality of alpha rhythm of a patient or the subject taken with a squid detector in May 1971. Here the patient has eyes open, eyes closed, which makes the alpha rhythm dominating, and again eyes open. So that's quite interesting. First squid recording of the MEG. It was made in this magnetically shielded room in MIT. That is a superconducting detector there. In the beginning of magnetoencephalography research, it was believed that firstly, on the basis of the Helmholtz theorem, EEG and MEG record independent information. Secondly, because of the high resistivity of the skull, which was uh, adopted from the Raspberry skull paper, 80 to 1, and because MEG leads fields are tangential, MEG has better ability to focus the recording. That is what was believed. And we have shown we did show that neither of these uh, beliefs are true. Firstly, we did show in 1995 that EEG and MEG lead fields are independent, but the signals are not. This is a story which I told you already before. It is first time it is published, it is briefly published in the book. And then we have some other papers where they are in more detail, but it was first in the book. About how about the, so I don't return back to the, to the uh, uh, independence because that I told already in, in, in the chapter 12.10. 12 12 uh, I go to the second issue, which is the sensitivity distribution of MEG leads, how they look like. This is something which I already show, did show you earlier, which is true. This is true. This is an important point. If we have the magnetometer coil here, symmetry axis goes through the spherical head model in homogeneous head model. The lead field 
is flowing tangentially and it does not break the surface between brain and skull region so it does not matter what is the resistivity of the skull because the magnetic permeability of the skull is same as that of space it is uh, it is uh, transparent to the magnetic fields the magnetic lead field is not distorted by the high resistivity skull this is fact this is true and that is great it means that the magnetic field due to the electric activity of the brain can be the equation can be uh, simplified we can take this term second term off because there is no um, no uh, lead field going through these uh, these boundaries we can use only this simplified form that is important I calculated these are also the first calculations ever made I published this in in 80 1980 and 1987 uh, how does the MEG lead field look like in the head? This is one way to show it. We have one single coil magnetometer and levels which are at the distance of one radius, three radi and six radi from the coil level and uh, just a sketch how the head would be located here uh, in, in this situation. And that's how it looks like. Under the coil, these are the planes just these planes shown here under the coil at the distance of one coil radius the lead field current is flowing this way not shown with the flow lines but the current density vectors you see that it has its maximum about at the distance of one radi radius from the symmetry axis the center it is increasing to that and then it is decreasing the magnitude and it is tangential all around at the distance of 3 radii, uh, 3 times deeper, the maximum is somewhere here. But please note that I have multiplied these current density vectors with a normalization coefficient 5, because they are so small that you would not practically see them if I had not just scaled them higher. And at the distance of, 20, uh, sorry, distance of 6 radii, I have multiplied them with 20. To, to make it possible to see them. Anyhow, they are tangential, but the maximum sensitivity is a bit further away. And especially, please note that the, in this scaling, the lead current density vectors are about equally long as in this scaling, but because it is a uh, uh, normalization coefficient 20, it means that the measurement sensitivity here is 1 20th, 20th of the measurement sensitivity here, which means that the measurement sensitivity firstly is zero just on the symmetry axis, increasing up to the center uh, coil radius, going tangentially all the time, but when going further away, deeper to the skull, to the, to the brain, the measurement sensitivity decreases so fast that practically nothing is recorded there. This is how it shows, looks like with the, uh, with the uh, planar gradiometer. That is the typical uh, coil arrangement which is used nowadays, or this is not a very new invention. It has two coils <coughs> in series which are bound, bound in opposite direction in the figure of eight. Therefore, we just superimpose the lead fields of both of these and get that kind of lead field current density distribution and you find that it is linear here in the center it does not look too much vortex when going further away the linear region is larger and when going to the 6 radi distance it is very linear but now it is multiplied with 23.5 so that actually it is so low in intensity that nothing is recorded there. Just for comparison, we may place here a pair of EEG electrodes and find that the measurement sensitivity is quite similar with these electrodes than with the, uh, uh, with the, the planar radiometer. So what's the difference? That's the point. 
I compare these uh, EEG and MEG half sensitivity volumes, which means that I compare what is the ability of these methods to focus the sensitivity. So what is a spatial resolution? We have shown in 1997 that with the skull resistivity value of 80 to 1, which is the Raspberry skull value, MEG does not have better ability to focus the recording, unlike it was believed. I show you the results in detail. So, the message is here that the latest information indicates that the resistivity of the skull is only about 28 to 15 times that of the other tissues in the head. With this resistivity value, the ability of the EEG to focus its sensitivity is better than that of the MEG. There are the two publications, important publications, uh, made just in the 2000 and 2001, which I believe very much, which published these new uh, values for the skull resistivity. Here is an example of, of good marketing. It is in 1994, one company which was uh, uh, producing magnetoencephalography equipments had a very nice brochure and they claimed in the brochure that the spatial resolution for EEG is about 20 millimeters and for MEG about 3 millimeters. So it is an order of magnitude better spatial resolution for MEG, but they did not give any reference for this result. So this was just marketing, poor marketing, no scientific basis behind this. So we calculated what are these uh, spatial resolutions. We used the half sensitivity volume concept, so I don't already told it to you, so uh, I may skip it quite soon, quite fast. If there's electric activity, the brain is homogeneous. That's the electrodes, maximum sensitivity, half of the sensitivity. So these regions are the half sensitivity volumes. Most of the signal is coming from there. The smaller the half sensitivity volume, the better is the spatial resolution. That's the story. In the next slide, I will show you the size, the volume of the half sensitivity volumes to indicate the spatial resolution of, of uh, different systems. Please note that if the sensitivity is fully homogeneously distributed, then the half sensitivity volume equals the whole source area. So there is no focusing ability. That is like in vector electrocardiography. It don't have any focusing uh, property. Just to indicate what is the half sensitivity volume in various situations, I show you a very simple example. Assume that we place this kind of electrode to the brain. At the end of the insulated lead, there is a spherical electrode with the radius R sub E. When feeding a reciprocal current to here, the lead field current distributes radially in three dimensions. The surface of the electrode is 4 pi R E square. And then we find where is the surface which is two times the area of this electrode. If the surface is two times, the lead field current density is one half. So it bounds the half sensitivity volume. So it is easy to calculate the half sensitivity surface and find finally that the volume, half sensitivity volume, the total volume here is about uh, 12 times the electrode. Uh, to tell times the radius to the third power. So it is 1.4 times the electrode uh, radius. Let's speculate this with the homogeneous head model. Here is a slab model of the head, and please note that this is homogeneous. There is a scalp, skull, and brain, homogeneous model. If we have electrode here, the lead field current is flowing radially. Maximum sensitivity is here. 
and we find the radius where the surface is double. So this region here is the half sensitivity volume. And how much it is? It is about with these thicknesses of the scalp and skull, it is 1.2 cubic centimeter. That is a half sensitivity volume of a point EEG electrode if the head is homogeneous. So we calculated this for the real Russian Riskol model, for this model, and found what are these uh, half sensitivity volumes for EEG, and what are they for MEG. Here is one single coil, and he, here are the, is the half sensitivity volume. It is uh, like a, a toroid going ar around the symmetry axis, and here are the isosensitivity the surfaces, zero on the axis, very low down here, and that is a half sensitivity volume. This is a bipolar planar gradiometer uh, system, and the half sensitiv sensitivity volume is here. We calculated this for a, a two electrode EEG when the electrodes are taken further away, just the basic calculation which I did show with the Russian Riskol model. For a three electrode system, that's why that we get the radial uh, uh, sensitivity. For axial gradiometer, when having the two coils of, of, of the of the uh, gradiometer and as a function of the baseline, and for planar gradiometer having the two coils and as a function of its baseline. This is how it looks like. This is the result. Resistivity ratio in the model is 80 to 1. That is, of course, relevant only for EEG, not for the MEG at all. When having one single coil, the half sensitivity volume is about uh, uh, 60, 62 cubic centimeter. The inner sphere volume, the brain volume total is 2,000 uh, and so cubic centimeters. For axial gradiometer, when we take the coils closer to each other, from uh, about 300 millimeters to zero, the half sensitivity volume decreases so having axial gradiometer with short baseline makes the, the uh, uh, spatial resolution better. This is for a planar gradiometer, which has much better spatial resolution, much smaller uh, half sensitivity volume. Single EEG electrode has that half sensitivity volume Having the two electrodes, now it is 180 degrees is the distance of the coils, taking them closer and closer, sorry, electrodes taking them closer and closer, we get better spatial resolution with EEG than with MEG. And this is a three electrode system, I don't speak too much about that. To get the indication to the real life here, I've shown the distance of electrodes in 21, 64 and so on, 512 electrode systems. Let's magnify this region. That is an interesting region. Let's magnify it. And only having planar gradiometer and two electrode EEG. You find that with the resistivity ratio 80 to 1, EEG is first better, then it is a bit worse, and then again better than MEG when taking the electrodes closer and closer, or the coils closer and closer. That's the publication. If the skull resistivity is 80 times, it's like this, 20 times, 15, 10, and 5 times the other resistivities. If it is, here is the realistic value for the skull resistivities about 5 to 8 or 15, you find that with all electrode distances compared to the similar gradiometer coil distances, EEG has better spatial resolution. I always am sorry that we did not calculate for that one-to-one -one because that is a homogeneous sphere, but we can estimate that it goes somewhere a bit lower. We should have calculated that, unfortunately. Let's magnify this. Here is a MEG planar gradiometer spatial resolution, 
and here is uh, EEG with 15 to 1, EEG with 5 to 1. You see that EEG is better. Here are the electrode distances in real case, having uh, 128 uh, electrodes equally spaced, 256 electrodes, 512 electrodes, and 1000 electrodes. That is not relevant anymore, but somewhere here is a relevant region. You see that EEG has clearly better spatial resolution than MEG. This is the truth, but this is not the whole truth. We may make the radiometer, the magnetometer coil radii smaller from 10 to 1 millimeter, and it is possible, even though there is a vacuum isolation between the coils and the head, to take the coil even to the vacuum space, so make the shorter the distance. It is possible to even to get 10 millimeters distance for the coil from the scalp. So you find that with that system, the spatial resolution is about the same. But that you don't get with the whole head newer, only in the small location. I skip that. On the real case, you have also to consider what is the effect of noise. And here it is calculated the effect of relative noise level, the number of EEG electrodes and the number of source areas on the solvability of the cortical potential distribution. In the message, this is a bit complicated here, the number of source areas, number of reconstructable source areas, and number of electrodes as a parameters, and relative noise level here. It is possible to find that when having higher noise, it doesn't matter how many electrodes you have, you don't gain too much. It is on the uh, smaller electrode number. Practically, in clinical work, 64 electrodes is fine. 120 electrodes need a good situation. 256 electrodes to get the proper noise level needs active electrodes, absolutely. Summary. Well, when I published these results, I became overnight world famous. All the MEG community colleagues, they were very unhappy and uh, angry to me when I got these results. And they had spent millions of dollars to the MEG devices. But this result is not my fault. It is the fault of James Clerk Maxwell. Because he wrote so unfavorable equations for the magnetic field. So these are uh, laws of nature. And that is the fact. But anyhow, I felt myself like a village mad. When I was in the conferences, uh, my colleagues uh, turned uh, back to me. When I happened to go to the elevator at the same time, they were just going back and they didn't look at me. So I was very unhappy for, th for that time. Until Liu, Dale and Bellevue published, they are famous colleagues in uh, in uh, United States, published this uh, Monte Carlo simulation studies of EEG and MEG localization accuracy. They, firstly, they referred also to my work, you can see it here, and some other works. And they got the result given to our particular forward and inverse models. Our results show that surprisingly, EEG localization is more accurate than MEG localization for the same number of sensors average over many source location orientations. So I was very happy from this publication because I, I, I got, got back my self-confidence and, and it was shown by colleagues that what I had calculated was correct. Uh, the story continues. It is never-ending story about the uh, relative uh, competence of EEG and MEG, but it's an interesting story. Here is one property. Let's consider briefly, simply, the tangential and radial sensitivity of these systems. It is a fact that magnetoencephalography records only the tangential components of the source. But with oops, electroencephalography, it is possible to record both radial and tangential components. The bipolar electrode system records tangential components and 
uh, two electrodes on opposite sides of uh, unipolar electrode records radial, or it can be used as a three electrode system, one in the center and two on the sides as, as a, a, a minus pole, which has radial sensitivity. So that is important that with MEG you can record only tangential components, not radial ones. It is shown here. Yeah. Uh, in EEG you see that there are only, uh, with this bipolar electrode you can find uh, uh, here uh, tangential, tangential sensitivity and with this unipolar electrode radial sensitivity. With axial gradiometer only tangential sensitivity similarly as with the planar system only tangential. That's the explanation to my claim. So I have good news. EEG is much better than it was thought before. That is my message. I do not claim that MEG should not be recorded, no. But when recording MEG, you should be aware of its limitations. That is the point. Here is a, a vector view magnetoencephalography device. They are very expensive ones. These are developed in Finland. Uh, you may understand what kind of I had with the group in, uh, with MEG. Uh, these are very expensive. They are sold quite much all around the world and there are other producers as well. It's nice for the patient. Uh, uh, therefore, that is not needed to place the electrodes. Just patient is, is, is lying here or sitting under the, under the dewar. Unfortunate, uh, unpleasant is that the patient shall not move the head, so it must be in the fixed position, all the recording session. Unlike in EEG, the patient may move freely. So these are just uh, uh, speculations and discussions of the, uh, of the benefits and drawbacks of the systems. I show you one point here, which is that uh, what is uh, the result of combining information of these different uh, recording methods. I start with a simple situation when we have two EEG leads, which are similar. One lead like this and the other lead just similar. They both, EEGs number one and number two, they record the same information of the brain and combining this information does not bring anything new. It is just the same. If we have two leads, EEG leads, just an example, one here and other one normal to that. The lead fields of these two uh, recordings are normal everywhere in the head. But as I did show you earlier, the signals are not fully independent. They are partially independent. So EEG lead 1 records about this information and EEG lead 2 about this information. The amount of information in both leads is quite the same. But it is so much overlapping that independent information obtained in the other lead is quite limited. But combining the information of the two EEG lead leads increases the total information, but not doubles. This is the point. Increases, but not doubles. What I claim is that it's possible to combine electric and magnetic recording. In proper placing of the EEG and MEG, it is not this, it's a bit different placing. I should draw it again. The leads are normal everywhere. Lead fields are normal everywhere. I claim that the situation is same as in the previous case. Both of these systems 
this EEG and that MEG record about the same amount of information which is partially independent. So most of the information is overlapping the green region. There's some additional information obtained with the other modality. Because both of these systems, both EEG, well it is clear here in the two first two cases that these EEG1s and EEG2s, they are recording basically the same source, the electric activity of the brain cells. But that is the case also when having EEG and MEG, the MEG signal is the magnetic field which is induced by the electric activity of the brain cells. So they have the same physiologically, the same source, but that is the EEG, is the measuring it with the flux source from the total source and MEG, the vortex source. But then if we combine information from recording systems which are based on different, different uh, uh, physiological property, like EEG and functional MRI, they are more independent, these uh, sources, and when combining these informations, the total information is larger. That's my point. So when making biomagnetic recordings, MEG recordings, the scientists may claim that they get something which is not possible to get with the EEG. Usually they do not record the EEG simultaneously to recognize that most of what they record with MEG is possible to obtain with EEG only. That's unfortunate. But I agree that there is a region of information which is not possible to get with the EEG, but is possible to get with the MEG. That is true. I fully agree. And it is only a question that how much you want to pay from this. That's my point. Here is an interesting uh, paper. Uh, I come later on to the magnetocardiography, where we got quite important, interesting results. There, I wrote an article uh, to brain topography about these issues and uh, MEG and EEG, and I had heard that I got some information that Masaki Iwasaki had made similar studies with EEG and MEG as we had made with ECG and MCG, but I did not find the paper when writing to the brain topography article. I found it later on, and I just was happy to find it I have tried to contact Masaki Iwasaki, but he has not responded. I may guess why, I tell you later. But uh, anyhow, what is important is that his results look very similar with uh, magnetoencephalography as our results with magnetocardiography. And therefore, it is very important that we both made studies with different patients. He made with brain, we made with heart and we came to the same conclusion about the independence and new information of these combined systems. That is important. So we, our works, his work confirms our results and our work confirms his results. So he had this kind of illustration which looks very much the same uh, uh, geometrically as from my paper. But he don't unfortunately refer to my paper and I couldn't refer to his paper because I didn't know about that paper. This is my paper in, in Osaka last July, where I did show these magnetocardiography results. I come to this later on. And Iwasaki's magnetoencephalography results, because I then already had them. I could refer to his work. I was very happy with this. So what he got? He recorded epileptic spikes from patients with EEG and MEG. And he found 
that there are epileptic spikes which are possible to record only with detect only with EEG, spikes which are possible to detect only with MEG, and spikes which are possible to detect with both methods. That's just according to our philosophy. And here it is shown in a different way. Unique MEG spikes with a blue, unique EEG spikes with yellow, and common spikes with green. So that's how it looks like. This just confirms our thoughts that uh, both systems, electric, bioelectric and biomagnetic systems, bring about the same information of the source and the information is not the same, not fully independent. It is partially overlapping, which means partially independent. That's how it goes. In Mangito, Cardiography, I show this principle, which is surprising, does exist already before biomagnetism was used. It's a law of nature. Final conclusions. The electroencephalogram and magnetoencephalogram are only partially independent. The MEG does not have better spatial resolution than the EEG. Combined use of EEG and MEG improves the diagnostic performance because it gives more information. The high resolution EEG electrodes and caps need further development to meet the needs of high quality recording. If as much millions and billions of dollars and euros are spent to for a developing high resolution EEG as has been spent for high resolution MEG, I think we would have a nice EEG devices. It is uh, 19 to 12. My story about electro and magnetoencephalography is now in end. And the next topic would be on electrocardiography, 12 lead ECG, but I think it might be better not to go to this topic now because uh, next week we don't have a lecture. Uh, it's two weeks to the next lecture. I think it is more beautiful to stop EEG here, MEG and EEG here, and after two weeks to start from the heart. Thank you very much. <laughs>